Daryl. Well, it, it's starting to happen now. So I see attendance starting to come in. This is good. Um, they're coming in pretty quickly now. Uh, oh, 12, 13. Rich Wilson. Dan Tillis, once again, great to see you here. Carissa, you had some friends who were coming on. Uh, yeah, Jody Ray. Hi, Jody. I guess they, they, can't, they can't talk, but I can talk to them. You can talk to them. Yeah. The Shirley's are there again. Hi, Ken. It's great to have you back. Um, it's moving up pretty quick. Uh, Stephanie Marion, Marciani, great to see you again. Hey, Steve Tamborelli, great to oh, have you. Oh, hey, Steve. <laughs> oh, and Phil, my friend Phil is on. Phil Clemson. Hey, Phil. This is fun. Oh, yeah. my father-in-law is on there. Hi, Jim. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. Hey, guess who's really on the top of the list? Uh -oh. Your sister, Alexa. Oh, Alexa, yay. So I know yeah. our mother is trying to get on, too. We so right. I guess we I guess we sh can't shout out some people and not the others. But hey, John, nice to have you on. I've got John Pruitt and John Dano and John Jackson. Well, we have about half of the participants that have signed in. So let's just give them another moment or two and we can kind of talk amongst ourselves. Uh, Carissa, um, in a moment, I'll introduce you and Philip and uh, uh, there are uh, people keep coming, coming on in. Uh, this is terrific. The problem is they're coming in in different spots. So I don't know if I've already said hello to them or not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Rissa? Yes. What's Can that? You hear me? Oh, well, are you, are we starting? Am I smart? Am I on? No, not quite yet. You'll be about okay. right. But I think, okay. That's a well, this is just a, you, just a sneak, you know, preview. I just turned to the camera around. Uh, let's see, somebody's asking a question. Any chance of my, oh, already the questions are coming in. And this is, this is a question I was hoping would come up. Any chance of printing another book? And uh, so th that is, yep. a, this yes, is a sir. good question. That means yes, there's a high demand, Cyril. I, and, I and like that. The, I, I hope that we have uh, polls already to go so we can find out how many how do you from Colorado? Oh, I have to shout out to Scott Thomason from Colorado, our all-time record-holding number one sales rep for Chapelet forever. What a delight to have you here, Scott. What did he sell? A couple thousand cases in one year? A uh, hundred cases a month was his, was his deal. <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, uh, Scott, a bottle of a bottle of day a bottle of day of Chapelet. He never went out without a bottle of Chapelet in his bag, and, and we weren't his only clients, but we thought we were. He well, says he says it was the great wines, not just him. That's true to his spirit. Well, it's great to see everybody here. I think we are going to kind of start. We've got about three minutes in, um, and I, I think we're going to uh, start with this uh, and. Why don't we start with uh, Carissa? Uh, you're probably um, what's through that door in front of you? Why don't you explain where you are, and then I'll explain who everybody is. All right. So let's see. I'm here. So you can see it, right? Yep. Okay. So I thought that I would uh, start by taking you in to where many of the dragons currently reside. And if you can see, this is the door latch, which is a small tortoise. And we enter in to a magical kingdom. And presenting right in front of me is a painting of lieges. And you might see some familiar characters here. And I'm just giving you a little brief tour of my own personal Big Sur Dragon's Lair. So this is what I came to talk about today, but luckily we have Philip here with us who's going to be talking about what's inside these amazing bottles and Cyril here to keep us on track. So this is just a little preview of what we're talking about today. And now I'm going to switch to me and there we are. There might be an appearance by my famous dog, Tuck, from time to time. 
And um, one of the things we thought we'd do is I'd give you a little um, background about the dragons and we'll be getting into tasting the wines. So some people have the wines with them. Some people will just get to enjoy it uh, vicariously. Oh, uh, Texas has just jumped in on the calls. So it's, good, it's tricky for the three of us to watch the names that are coming in and also continue with our line of thought. Uh, so uh, forgive us if we, if we don't shout out to every name, but we're really glad to have an audience. And so, now Carissa, we've just had- I'm gonna take one second, Carissa, and inter while you're taking, showing a picture of your dog playing around, I'm gonna uh, introduce uh, who is who we are and 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 what this is all about so uh, i'm cyril chapelet uh currently the ceo of chapelet uh, winery and our family's business i just finished an all-day board meeting and somehow uh i have not been elected off the island so i guess i'm still the chairman for another until the next board meeting and then it can be voted off again but uh my job is to kind of herd the cats and keep things moving in the right direction and uh, do what I can do to uh, drive our business at every level. And, uh, and the fellow at the top in front of the wine tanks there is our notorious winemaker, Philip Titus, who has been with us for uh, pretty much his whole life in the wine career, although he did take a stint for a brief a little ed edgerin to go with, work with some other folks, which uh, was a great experience because it really broadened his horizon on what, what he could do. And uh, um, so I'll let Philip talk a little about himself too, but Philip is uh, the critical person who has put the wine in the bottle, so to speak, and is the one person who has created the Malbec because we didn't have a Malbec before Philip came on and started creating that. And uh, so we'll talk about, Philip will be speaking about the, the physical wines and answering any other questions. A couple important things as we get going is the other person in the, uh, on the screen is my sister Carissa. And Carissa is our uh, inside attorney for the family and she deals with all the estate planning, all the state issues, but she also has a passion in painting really beautiful, really cool dragons. And part of what this whole experience is today is to talk about the dragons, the Malbec, what inspired that, how do we end up where we are, and, uh, and Carissa give a few stories about the dragons uh, and maybe even how she convinced dad to uh, come along with putting the, the wines that are in the bottle with her label on it on the outside. So I think the most important thing is uh, if people could pull up a glass of wine of some type, my hope is that it might be one of the Malbecs. Uh, I happen to have the 14 Malbec right here and I, hope, I don't know if people can see this, but it's one of the Malbecs that Carissa and Philip will be trying. Uh, so I have that here in my uh, wine cellar. So I'm in my cellar, Chris is in her cellar, and Philip is in our, the virtual winery uh, right there. Chris has already got her bottles open. I hope that everybody else has their bottles open. And uh, just a little cheers to Carissa and Philip. Uh, that's a, a clink of the glasses, kind of sounds like this. Mine keeps disappearing. Yes, Ooh, depending on where you are. Uh, yeah. That virtual site. I'm so, in the pyramid, so cheers, everybody. So I think uh, if, uh, Philip, if you could just say a little bit about yourself and what your, uh, what your role is here and, and just talk about yourself for just a moment, then I can have Carissa uh, start into uh, the, the dragon layer and uh, talk a little bit about, uh, about what inspires her. Sure. Um, well, uh, gosh, I, at, this, at this stage, I feel like I'm so synonymous with Chapelet that I have to go. I have to go back in time to remember what what I was doing before Chapelet. Um, but I did. Uh, I did grow up in a vineyard in in Saint Lena. Although we lived in uh, my family lived in Sonoma, and my dad had his practice there. But he, my mother and father bought vineyards in uh, St. Helena the, the, a year after the Chapelets bought their property. But, um, and so of course, our vineyard manager, Dave Perio is there and you know, all the Chapelet kids, but I never met them because uh, I went to school in Sonoma and they went to school mostly in St. Helena or uh, some other um, 
private schools out of town, but uh, so we never crossed paths till um, the 80s. But uh, growing up on a vineyard and making wine, um, I, I think when you grow up on a vineyard, you're kind of destined to be part of this industry because it's, uh, once you get a sense of it, it, it doesn't seem like, why would you do anything else? Um, so I did study winemaking. I, I went to Davis and signed up to make wine when I was 18. Uh, just kind of no idea what I was doing. Um, but you really don't get to study wine for at least two years after you join the, the enology department at Davis because the first two years is just pretty much chemistry. Um, so uh, uh, about the time you're old enough to drink, you do get to study a little bit of winemaking. Um, so, um, but one thing that, um, you know, my father had this vineyard and he was not a trained viticulturist, but the one thing he was, was a big reader and, uh, and he was, uh, he was great at studying things and, um, we were planting some vineyards and, um, he planted a little block of Malbec and a little block of Petit Verdot in uh, the 70s when there was no Malbec or Petit Verdot in Napa Valley. So we had about a three quarters of an acre of each. And that was, that when we made wine out of those, that was the first time I ever tasted Malbec. And it was such an elixir. It was this just amazing, dark, beautiful, flashy, red, you know, cherries and all this stuff. And so, um, I must say, you know, I, I haven't thought about a lot of this stuff because it was a long time ago, but I've had this love affair going with Malbec. So maybe uh, Chris and I are actually related. Um, for a, It's been a passion for a long time, and it started with my father really having no idea what Malbec tasted like or what he would use it for. He just said, well, you know, when you and your brothers, you know, when you get older and you start a winery, you're going to need this stuff. And uh, because he had read it in Hugh Johnson's. So apparently he was right about a few things. Um, and so Malbec um, became quite the passion. Um, anybody could grow Cabernet, but who could grow Malbec back then? And Petit Verdot. So, um, you know, that led to led me to Davis. That led me back to Chapelet. And other than that short little stint away from Chapelet in the 80s, um, I've been there since I graduated from Davis and um, have had such a great time watching the evolution of Chapelet and so happy I'm here now. Well, thank you, Philip, uh, very much. And uh, I think I'm going to transfer over to um, Carissa. There's already. One one of the panelists was asking, uh, just if while we've got Philip uh, talking, uh, how many cases of Malbec are we making? Not enough, I think, is the answer. But yeah, it's that's usually about the the right answer, and it can be a thousand cases, uh, twelve hundred cases in that range. And um, you know, and and the history of Malbec for us is there never has been enough. We never could figure out. We never fully committed to planting enough of it because when we did plant it really uh, initially it was all for blending you know uh, initially it all went you know to the Pritchard Hill Cabernet and and then it you know went to the Cabernet Franc and then it went to the signature Cabernet and so we it, was, it took a long time like 20 years before we had enough Malbec to really bottle by itself so um, now we now we have enough except in 2017, we really didn't have enough, yeah. uh, but we get close to having enough every year. And that is about a thousand cases, but that's after we use it um, in a number of other blends. And we, we now have three blocks of Malbec. And um, so we have different clones and, you know, different rootstocks and different locations on the property. But it, it first has to be, you know, if, if, the, if the Pritchard Hill Cabernet wants Malbec, it gets Malbec. And, you know, there's a little like a pecking order, but now we've got it set up that there is enough. So approximately how many cases a year do we try to make of that when we can? I would say averaging 1,200 cases. Okay. Hasn't really changed much now for a while. So, uh, Chris, at some point when you're talking, um, you've been asked by Patricia, what's, what's the motivation? and How do you come up with, with such creative ideas? when you're thinking about your dragons and what they're going to 
come come to be. So that's just as long as you weave that in, you know, that'll answer her question at some point. But Carissa, can you talk to us a little bit? Phil's talked a little bit about the wine and making them all back. Can you talk a little bit about uh, yourself and kind of who you are, and the, where you live, and what inspires you, and and then answer Trisha's question. All right. Well, all of that in one one gulp. Um, well, I, I live in Big Sur, and I'm inspired by the woods and the ocean and the magicalness of Big Sur, just as I was inspired by the magicalness of Pritchard Hill. And I actually, of all people, I credit um, Gott. Um, tell me his first name, who worked with us. Carrie. Carrie Gott, with inspiring me to take my dragons into our uh, winery and into our uh, domain of uh, weaving it into uh, to Chapelet because uh, he he said something he said I bet Carissa could could weave a story about these dragons and that really got me started and uh, gave me the impetus to present my one of my dragons as a possibility for an art label and as my family knows there was quite a bit of resistance to putting dragons on labels uh, at the beginning and when, when we first started uh, an art wine project, um, the first one that made seemed to make sense to everybody was Leisha's art because she's a full-time artist. So her art got chosen. And so the next year I brought a dragon again. I actually brought the same dragon to the table. And, but it was turned down in, uh, uh, in favor of Alexa's painting that had an image of the winery in it. And it was an abstract and everybody liked that. So by the third year, I thought, well, it must be my time. And I submitted the same dragon, uh, but it got turned down because Dominic submitted a digital image of our winery that everybody thought was cutting edge and would get all the Silicon Valley people to, to want to buy the wine. So I came the fourth year to the board meeting and I presented the same dragon. And I tell you, my dad's face was crestfallen when he saw it because he just shook his head. He said, Carissa, I love your dragons, but it just, I, what does it have to do with wine? And luckily this time I was prepared and I said, dad, don't you remember four million years ago when the dragons first came here to this mountain and it was 14,000 feet tall and they dug their tunnels and they began to put their fires inside and they were creating and I stopped, like I'm doing now, and he said, well, well, then what happened? And I said, well, if you'll use my dragon, I'll tell you the rest of the story about the dragons of Pritchard Hill. And he called me on my bluff. He said, you write that story and that book before our next wine comes out, and we will use your dragons. So that was the beginning. And what I'm going to do is show you one picture that's not in Searle's PowerPoint that he's about to put on. But this is actually the very first dragon, and it wasn't on the Malbec, it was on our clone wines. We had a, a clone series of wines. So that, that little dragon was the first, and it was a colored pencil drawing, and that was the beginning. And I, hence, I wrote this book, and in writing the book, I quickly invented all these other characters for the book, and they became the subject of the ongoing Malbec labels. And if Searle will put up a, the PowerPoint, I'll just briefly run through the little history of the, of the dragons that have made it on to the Malbec labels. And we will, uh, so speaking of when to drink, I, I hope everybody's at least having a little sip of the first wine while we're talking about, well, Which there's the first my one? sidekick, that's Tuck. All right, so this is the main character of the story, that's Scallon. And this is the first dragon that made it onto the Malbec, which was in 2007. And somebody just ticked in to ask about that other wine I showed you. The, um, the clone wine was 2005, I believe. But 2007 was the first Malbec with a dragon. And this is Phineas Day, who's on the cover of the Dragons of Pritchard Hill book. And he is a core dra diving dragon. And you'll notice on his back, his scales are like lava. That's because he lives inside the Earth's core. And you see, I can go on and on about the dragons, just like Philip can go on and on about the wines. 
So rather than tell you the in-depth story about each dragon, I'll just give you a taste. Uh, this next one is Torty Dre. So Torty Dre is inspired by the fact that I have two giant land tortoises. And so I combined the tortoise shell with the dragon and this magical uh, tortoise dragon uh, lives inside the shell and actually is uh, a dancing dragon. So there's subsequent stories about Torty Dre the Torty Dre is in the first book, and there's a lovely short story about the Torty Dre. So that was the second vintage. That was 2008. And here comes 2009. There's 2009. So again, people were always wanting to connect my dragons with the wine. So I made this dragon fly in and grab a couple uh, bunches of grapes off the vines. And this is Floralena. And so this, this dragon is the keeper of the grapes. And this dragon's image is very small in the book, but you can look through the book and you'll uh, find him in there. Uh, so you can see he's, he's guarding the grapes. And so Hello. now on to... I'm coming, sorry about that. Yeah, so this is 2010. And in 2010, that is the uh, Chinese year of the dragon. So I was inspired to do a Chinese style dragon and uh, it, it would happen to be the year of the golden dragon. So hence, this dragon has a golden mane, and this dragon's name is Renzo. And, uh, oh, that was backwards. Sorry. That's right. Okay, that's this one. This is Portia, and Portia is a mischievous little girl dragon who there's actually a song written about her, and at another presentation, maybe I'll bring my friend Pete, the banjo player, in to uh, sing this song for you about Portia. But she's a mischievous dragon, and she likes to... Uh, jump into the vats of wine. And so when she was very little, she had white wings of snow, but now you can see there's a purple glow. See, that's part of the poetry there. Okay, so on to great grandma Millie Murple. And grandma Millie Murple is on our 2012 vintage. And she uh, always wears a vest and she's a keeper of the family archives and the family library. And really this is inspired by my grandmother who uh, was always keeping track of all of our family and which is quite extensive as some of you know. And so this uh, keeper of the family archives is featured in book one, but um, her archives are heavily featured in the upcoming book two. And then we get to 2013 and this is Princess Aras. And she is the keeper of the small winged things. So she looks after all the little insects of the world. And then in 2014, we get Rechnik. And you can see he's thinking deeply about something and he's got kind of a crazy outfit on. And if you take his name and spell it backwards, you get the word thinker. So this is the thinker. And inside his wings is the whole universe displayed of stars. And on his pendant, if anybody has a screen that you can close up on the pendant that he's wearing on his neck, you'll see what actually became the grower collection symbol that he's wearing on his neck. No okay. Way. Really? Yeah, you gotta look closely, it's there. <laughs> and we're gonna, so you should be tasting records. I have to go to a right? webinar to find this out. Yeah, you should be tasting, the, you'd be taste, hopefully you're tasting uh, Rechnik right now. Let me just take oh. a taste while we're talking. Oh yeah, he's, he's drinking nicely. Okay, so this is 2015. This is Dr. Joseph Bender. And Philip and I had quite a time with Joseph Bender because he's an alchemist and he makes um, elixirs that are magical elixirs that prolong life. Well, we thought that was fine and dandy. However, the um, licensing bureau for labels did not want to put that onto a wine label. You could not say that it was an elec elixir and that it had some magical properties. And I tried in vain to explain that I was talking about the dragon, not the wine. We changed three times in order to get the uh, final saying right. And it started out saying that Dr. Bender uh, was an alchemist who creates transformative elixirs which have the ability to bring joy into one's life. And we ended up having to say, Dr. Bender is an alchemist famous for using his mental powers when blending together essences, creating delightful surprises. So we couldn't say it had any healing properties of any kind. So uh, anyway, that was sort of fun, a little behind the scenes thing. 
All right, then this is Tinka. This will be the, the third wine that we'll taste today, uh, 2016. And she actually is a chef. So you can read more about her in book two. And if enough of you write in saying we are demanding book two, maybe I can get enough time to uh, stop doing my legal stuff and spend the attention where it belongs on these dragons and get the next book out. So I think the next picture, Cyril, will give us a chance to be tasting some wines. And it's a good place for us to pause having just talked about Recknick and Tinka and Dr. Bender. And so maybe, um, maybe we'll jump to you, Philip, to talk a bit about the uh, 2014 uh, vintage of uh, the Malbec. Philip, I'm gonna help you a little bit because uh, Heather Barth uh, sent me some emails last night saying, well, when should I open the wines? You know, how should I get them ready? And I said, maybe an hour ahead of time uh, would be good. And she says that's worked really well. She sent a note back. What would your thought be if you were setting up a tasting like this? How much time would you open those ahead of time? Well, you know, I, I don't think these wines at, at this age um, need to be opened uh, in advance, although it's nice. I think uh, I love the what we use is the these Riedel uh, Magnum decanters because they actually give a lot of wine a lot of air to the wine. There's a lot of headspace in there. And so I'm, I'm always an advocate of about one hour uh, ahead of time if you're going to do it, if you want to get that development. Um, you know, two or three hours, I kind of feel like you might miss something. You know, there are stages that wines go through and uh, some of them might be very pleasing and, and I would hate to miss something. And especially with old wine, sometimes that that perfect moment is is almost fleeting. So I've I've always been uh, uh, more of the mind to open them up, let them sit for a while, and then try them and kind of uh, you know keep tasting through all the the, the different um, stages they go through. Um, but that you know that is one of the things that um, we were talking about is like you know the when to drink your dragon, and it's like well when do you drink the dragon? Um, I think Malbec is, um, what, I, what I really love about Malbec is um, it's such a great blender for one. It, it's such a great thing to, to add to a Cabernet, uh, to a Merlot, even to Cabernet Franc, because it, it's a wine that is um, just naturally very deep in color. You know, just this purple, you know, inky color that um, develops in the fermenter within, uh, you know, literally days of crushing the grapes. The, you, it's, you, you just don't find light colored Malbecs, but most really dark colored uh, wines, you know, made from grapes that produce dark colored wines are also very tannic. Like a Petit Syrah is generally very tannic. Um, Petit Verdot can be very tannic and they're very dark, but then they have this, structural component that is something to be very you know cautious of otherwise otherwise the wine gets too big uh, but Malbec is it's deeply colored but in a but really restrained in tannin and uh, you know most of the tannin people think tannin comes from the skins of the grapes and some does but really most of it comes from the seeds and um, you know, it's something about the, the seeds in Malbec that don't give up a lot of tannin. And so you get this kind of dark, rich, but uh, very balanced and opulent wine. And, and, and I think it can be drunk young um, and enjoyed for all its kind of fruitiness and lushness. But wines like when we get to the, to the uh, well, the 14 and the 15, you know, those aren't old wines, but they're wines that have had some time to age but they're aging so beautifully and slowly and gracefully. And that's really a function of all that color. The color is like a preservative. It's, a, it's an antioxidant. You know, you, you drink wine, you know, it, it has antioxidants. Those antioxidants are in the anthocyanins of the grape. And it's the, that, that color is a preservative and these wines will age gracefully, uh, slowly. Um, so I think you can drink it young for all its, you know, beautiful fruit and the fun that it has, you know, it tastes almost like the grapes. And then you can let it age and um, 
and I, I think really seeing some some real graceful changes in the wine in the 14 and the and the 15 that are just starting to show some bottle bouquet little breaking down around the edges fruits not so young and bright it's developing more liqueur -y character so i i think you can you can drink the uh dragon uh i think you can drink it young and i think we did we don't well we do have some old malbecs but i haven't yet to see one get too old we need to we need to go back and open some of the uh you know the 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 08 and 09 since you know i haven't had those now for a while but when i have um at 10 years or so, the, the wines are aging beautifully. You know, I just got a message from uh, Cindy Shopoff saying that she was able to pull all these bottles out of her, of her own cellar. And um, I think it's a good time to ask a little poll. And I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put a poll up. And the poll is, do you collect the Malbec because of the dragons on them or strictly because of the wine? So you can either say yes or no. Actually, you just say it's, uh, I'll just leave it at, do you collect the Malbec because of the dragon on the label? There's a yes or no. So I'm going to launch that poll right now if I can find my mouse. There it is. And so and what I'd like people to do is go ahead and vote yes. Okay, we're starting to get people coming in. We have, um, oh vote. my goodness, we're getting a high Host, oh, host can't vote. You can't vote, Carissa. I Phillip. can't vote. Oh, oh man. No. Um, uh, meanwhile, Steve Tamborelli is currently drinking the 2009, and somebody just at, was asking how that was tasting, and Steve is telling us that it's tasting fabulously. So if you have the 09, that's a treat waiting for you. Get going, Steve. <laughs> Hold on to those wines. <laughs> well, so I'll, I'll close this in just one second. The, uh, the the poll has been on for about 45 seconds. Uh, we'll give it a, I'll give it a full minute, but um, so of the people voting, 66% of the people are buying it because buying it to uh, because of the label and 39% are not at this point. So uh, so a high okay. percentage Carissa, are buying it for the label. That's very cool. We'll, we'll put up another one afterwards, but Carissa, maybe you want to talk about uh, what, uh, about the bit label and about, about. Well, and, and let me, um, I'll just, uh, a couple of questions have also been coming in. Philip, uh, they're asking if it's 100% Malbec every year. Um, you know, and, and um, you know, everything we do in, in wine making, um, it really, we don't make too many things that are 100% varietal and um, other than, you know, Chenin, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir. But when we get into making anything that's, you know, uh, part of the Bordeaux family, um, we've always we've planted all these things because they all blend well together. And on any given year, um, there's a synergy and you look for the synergy. Um, we do have one wine, the 2016, that's 100% Malbec. And to, you know, my memory doesn't go back. Maybe Steve can remember it here, or if he's got, doesn't say on the bottle on the 2009. Um, but um, it's almost always a blend. We always look at, you know, what does the wine need to make it even better? Uh, Cabernet, we blend in Malbec, Petit Verdot, Merlot, uh, Cabernet Franc. Uh, Malbec is generally for us blended with a little Cabernet Sauvignon uh, to give it maybe a little more dark fruit and a little more of a different kind of structure, a little backbone that Cabernet has. We, uh, we blend in Merlot. So the 2014 is 9% Merlot and 8% Cabernet Sauvignon. Merlot, in our terminology, we say it has a kind of a red fruit, but more of like a rum raisin, like a sweet, uh, a sweet red fruit, and that's very nice in Malbec. Uh, we wouldn't, I, and I don't think we ever have blended Cabernet Franc into Malbec because those two things kind of don't go together. The herbaceousness and the you know black tea and sage and all that that's in Cabernet Franc is that's not necessarily going to be synergistically helping the uh, Malbec, but a tiny little bit of Petit Verdot, some Cabernet, some Merlot, those things just make the wine better. 
in 2016, we couldn't make it better. We blended it with everything. We kept liking 100% Malbec, so we just, that's what we did. But that's, that's an anomaly. And, you know, we're blenders, we're winemakers. We'll figure out a way to make something better if we can. Speaking of the nuances and the flavors, um, someone is asking about uh, food pairings with the Malbec. Uh, do either of you have uh, particular food pairings that you like over other things? I like well, I like Cyril, Cyril, you're a you're a, a much you're much better at this than I am because I'm I'm sort of like not very picky. So, <laughs> so. I, I, and the, and I'm a vegetarian, and people usually think you know red wine and, and meats, but uh, I tell you, a good smoked grilled tofu and the malbec you can't, really can't beat that. And uh, uh, of course, of course, any of the um, salmon is a good another good thing. But I find it's things that I'm maybe not quite sure that. I want to have a full Cabernet, so um, a risotto is a beautiful mix, usually with a Malbec. Yeah, yeah I think those are really the light, maybe you know not not the not you know Cabernet is sort of almost synonymous with uh, red meat. Um, Cabernet Franc and lamb, uh, I hear, is like the quintessential. Um, well, we'll have to come up with the, you know, that's, it's such a good question because it is a, 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 a versatile wine. And I think like the things you said, Carissa, but I, I think it does go with a lot of things, but maybe there's a thing that it goes perfectly with. And we just oh, have- um, Cindy, Cindy and Bill Shopoff say paella is a great match. So we'll, we'll put that into the mix. Um, well, maybe also, Argentinian food. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, also a couple of people wanted to clarify their vote. So they wanted you to know, Philip, that the quality of the wine in the bottle keeps them coming back for more dragons. So they are not uh, mutually exclusive, the love for the dragons. It it's, uh, shows up in the wine and they appreciate uh, that they're getting a great wine uh, inside of the dragon. Well, I think uh, that's important. It's important to have quality inside and quality outside, just like a good person. And one, one of the panelists right now is having a crostini with uh, seared filet and uh, tr grove truffle cheese and thinks that is working just fine. Well, I think that, you know, having those earthy flavors, I think, uh, fits well with, uh, with the Malbec. Uh, uh, I've done some smoked, uh, smoked meats that, um, that um, I've served the Malbec with, and there's enough structure in that. Uh, that it works well. I wouldn't overly smoke it. I don't mean dark, dark smoke, but just a little bit of, of tinge kind of gets that earthiness to it also. So there's a lot of options uh, with it. And I think the, the best way to find out is to try it. And, and I'd say that if there's any of our guests who have a remarkable uh, selection or suggestion for uh, something that goes well, well with it, send it to us and we'll probably put it in our newsletter. So uh, smoked, the, smoked duck came up. So one of the panelists was also, or one of the uh, participants talking about the etched bottles. So I'm just showing an etched bottle. And most years we make a limited number of etched bottles uh, that you can uh, usually sort of pre-order. We, we love it if we know in advance because they're uh, pricey to make, but they are lovely to have. So. These are just a few of the, the etched bottle images. This one actually has three dragons on it. So Carissa, how big a bottle is that and how many people would that serve? Can you hold this for me? So I've got my assistant holding this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lift one up that's empty. This is the only empty bottle in my cellar. But can you see that? Is that pretty good? Yep. So this is a nine liter, we call it a Salmanazar. And it's, here, I'll go. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, let me just flip my view around. Technical. It's a, it holds a case of wine. So you want to have a big, a big group, maybe 50 to 70 people uh, if you're going to open that bottle. And there's actually a special leather harness that they make to help pour that because when you're pouring a full case of wine, which is about 40 pounds, you need maybe a little help to, to pour that around. And the leather harness is terrific. Many of you have seen me at some of the parties at the, at the picnic area, walking around with a large bottle. But if you're 
besides just your arms giving out, the ability to pour it very steadily and not to have it gurgle out and make a mess all over. Because there's so much volume in it, you might send that wine onto your guest that you're trying to pour it for rather than into their glass. So the, the little harness that uh, you put over your shoulder really, really helps to hold these big bottles. So I recommend uh, one of these units. Uh, and if you can't find one, how to get one, let, let me know and I can uh, find a so, booth or something. Cyril, Cyril um, uh, David is asking if we, is the PowerPoint still up? Yes. Because if, if we could turn the PowerPoint off when Philip or I are speaking, then we become bigger on the screen for oh, them. Oh, I am so sorry. I, how sim I mean, I don't mind. I don't mind being very small in the corner, but there maybe we go. Philip wants That's to have. We need to take yeah. off the uh, the the, uh, the the little voting card. Oh yeah. Is that still on? I, I think yeah, if you still. if you touch your screen, maybe. Oh, or I, I don't know if you have a touch screen. Is. Okay. Is that better? You know, the problem is you shouldn't have had the tech person running the show. That's why we have all these other people. So, um, so uh, what's interesting is we just got overwhelmed with chats and with questions on the chat side. And, uh, and there's also Q and A's too. Yeah. So can, can we get that off the screen? Is Cyril um, the, the is it still uh, on the screen? Yeah, the little ballot is still on my screen. Okay, so and somebody, somebody is saying that they weren't able to see when I was showing uh -huh. the etched bottle. So, yeah. so Philip, is that still that. on? Is, is that coming into the big screen view? There we go. Okay, I think that's what they wanted. So someone is also asking, can they get the three, uh, and uh, some of the panelists say the ballot's not on their screen, Philip, so it might be your own thing. Can I click it off? Showing the oh. some oh. etched bottles. I thought Cyril was in control. I just clicked it off mine. Yeah, maybe no, I'll have to see. And by, by special request, you can get, people are asking if you could get more than one dragon on a bottle. If we've got enough uh, lead time, we can do special special orders. Just uh, email me. I have a very private email, carissa at chapelet.com. You can email me directly and we'll, we'll give you the world in dragons. You can even have things like this dragon blanket that's behind me. Dragon buff. I, I think we should get on to wine number two. I'm dying now, to try the, the second one. Oh, wine number two yeah. is divine. The, the, the 2015 you know, when, when you say, what, what would you have with that? I might not have anything. Maybe just a little cheese, just to have something to nibble on. That wine is, it just drinks by itself. It's, it's, I see that age coming into it. It was obviously, it was a warm year and, and Malbec likes heat. Um, and it, it really likes a, a warm year. It's, it's a little more difficult to ripen um, than say Cabernet or Merlot. Um, and I think that's maybe why it's really not, it's a Bordeaux variety, but it's really not grown in Bordeaux anymore. Very, very little of it because it's, in reality, it's, it's, it's probably too cool in Bordeaux um, to really ripen it on most years, but it, it ripens so beautifully in California. And of course, the Eastern Hills of Napa Valley, any, any Bordeaux variety is, is gonna do better than most places. Um, so uh, I think that wine, it's got a ripeness and a sweetness and a silky, but kind of weighty texture. And I would just do what I've been doing. I'm just gonna drink it <laughs> by itself. Um, I'm sure it would be great with food, but I, honestly, it's, it's so good by itself. You don't, you don't really need much. You need a couch to sit on while you're drinking, and that's it. So, Philip, um, you touched on it a little bit about the Eastern Hills. Uh, there was a question from Scott Thomason who, Thomason who said, uh, what, why is the difference, or what is the difference between the Valley Floor Malbecs and Pritchard Hill and the area that you grow in? Because, uh, and he was really just giving us a compliment, but, uh, but I think that 
you might want to touch on that a little bit uh, about the difference between Valley Floor and Hillside all back. Sir so, since, since we're having a family chat here, can I tell you that when you look up, your eyes get um, two reflections of the lights, and it's very funny. Uh, you become an alien. So <laughs> if you look down or straight, you're fine. Um, I, that's very cute. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Malbec is, you know, for all the dark color that you see, like when, when you see a Cabernet with really dark color, you're usually thinking it's coming from a little tiny berry. Uh, Malbec just intrinsically has the dark color, but it's actually a large berry. It's a big, juicy berry. Um, and, um, and can actually, if it's, if, if we get a good set, it can actually produce quite a lot of uh, fruit per vine, uh, mostly just because of the berry size. And so I think, um, you know, the restrictiveness of the, you know, the, our, our rocky soils, our well-drained soils, that, that um, berry kind of shrinks down a little bit in the, um, in the hills, and I would say especially the eastern hills, because we're drier there, and we're a little warmer than the west or in the valley floor not uh, kind of a cooler day, but a warmer night, but it's, it's really the soil and climate together. You, you just get a more concentrated wine, but it's not like, um, you know, some things can become too concentrated, you know, begin to become tannic and, and hard to work with. Whereas Malbec's got that gentle tannin and you can just let it get very ripe. In fact, we have a little adage um, in, our, in our team that says, you know, when should we pick the Malbec? And we wait till it's, uh, you think it's time to pick it. And then you say, well, let's wait a week. And then you go back and say, well, when should we pick it? And say, let's wait another week. And then we, we check again. And then we say, well, let's wait another week. And so about the time you think it's ready to pick, it probably is going to be like three more weeks. And uh, because it, um, Malbec has the strangest, and I, I, I studied plant physiology, but I'm, I'm definitely not a plant physiologist. Uh, but, you know, like leaves in plants have stomates that allow them to breathe. And that's where that, you know, keeps a, a leaf, uh, it transpires uh, moisture through the leaf. And that's what keeps it from drying up and keeps it um, bringing, you know, uh, bringing in CO2 and giving off oxygen, the whole physiological part of a plant. Malbec has stomates in the grape. It has these little breathing um, cells. And so, the, it, you know, like a Cabernet, if it gets hot it'll, or Merlot, it'll just dry up. It'll become a raisin. Whereas Malbec will just sit there and get more and more flavor the longer it sits, but it doesn't turn into a raisin. And uh, these are things that we've learned over time. And uh, so it, uh, it, I think, well, the answer to you know, why in the hills, the valley floor, <laughs> I'm just pretty convinced that when you're talking about Bordeaux varieties, maybe with the exception of Merlot, uh, it's all better in the hills and all better in the eastern hills of, of Napa Valley. And especially when you're growing something that likes sun and, you know, a lot of sunshine to, to ripen. Philip, one of the things that we always try to do in these things is not to get too technical but the stall mates sound really good and that sounds really interesting and it's something that I'd never heard of before. So it's wonderful to learn something new and be a little technical, a little geeky and give people a little something. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, this is a unique variety. There's a lot of things about this variety that are unique down to, you know, some, it, it evolved differently, I think, than many other grapes. Well, the, uh, the 150 to 200 people who are out there right now all have a little bit of extra cocktail information to talk about these uh, stallmates uh, and what the, they go through the grape. And so I expect that they're going to have some extra conversation any place they are because you just gave them it's one of those little important little nuggets. Good job. If anybody needs any clarification on that, email me and we'll, we'll get it all down so that you're not making stuff up. Hey, Carissa. Yes, um, I, th I think it's time to get on to wine number three. Let's get on to wine number three. At the same time, uh, you probably want to do a shout out to your mother who's now watching you. <gasps> oh, hi, mom. Well, luckily, I gave her a preamble text moments before the, uh, this panel to let her know that this was a, a criticism-free zone. 
So she's um, very enthusiastic about my, um, my dragon mask. You see that? And I don't know if I'm on speaker view. Am I on speaker view? No. Well, anyway. Um, so uh, where were we? We're on dragon number three, which is Tinka. And it's the uh, 2016 vintage. And 100% Malbec. So if you, if, 100%. You, if you want to know what Malbec smells like before we, we uh, tinker with it, that's the wine. And it was tinker with a, Tinka. That was pretty yeah, good. There, there we go. <laughs> but you know, 2016 was just a great vintage. It's just undeniably a great vintage. It was, it was good for everything. Um, and uh, we made amazing Cabernet. We made amazing Cabernet Franc. The Merlot was great. The Malbec. Like I say, we didn't, we didn't think it needed any help. It was just all done for us uh, in, in the vineyard and, you know, fermentation and put it in barrels. And we're like, oh my God, this stuff is so good. We, we, really, didn't, we really didn't do much to it. Um, and uh, that doesn't happen very often. You know, making red wine is, you know, I, I say it's kind of mano a mano, you know, uh, red wines take a lot of attention. They take, you know, years to make. It's always making adjustments and blends and and you know worrying about them and everything and uh this this you know maybe if if the analogy that you know for children or something like that maybe that's the child that gave you no grief and then just turned out to just be you know you know you never have a favorite but you know they're in the running for the favorite anyway nice well the 2016 have a lot had a lot of remarkable vintage wines for chapelet that were created and uh, the Pritchard Hill uh, that you created uh, was a absolutely perfect wine by the uh, by the judges and by from a scoring standpoint, uh, you know it's it's been uh, interesting to uh, to see how well those wines are showing right now because those are kind of the most current wines that we've been had out there in the marketplace. Um, I'm I'm pretty impressed with this 2016. I think the wine is is quite open and quite delightful. I, I know that you were pretty high on the 15. Um, yeah, I, I like the 15. I like that kind of that little liqueur-y syrupy thing that's going on in it. But, you know, that's it's also just got the benefit of a little more age. Cyril, do you want to do a poll on that? Let me just see uh, where we are at the next poll. Um, I think that there's an, I can, oh, end that poll. Oh, gosh. Yeah, end that last one. Yeah. Um, Meanwhile, while he's finding the next poll, I'm which sure it has to be. For that one. Oh, there you go. Look at that. So I shared the results. You saw what happened there. Yep. Okay. Now I'm going to stop sharing that. And then. Um, so p some people are texting in asking, uh, can they buy these wines? Can they get another three pack? Uh, how do they order the Malbec? And uh, I know we've got some of our sales team on the line and I don't know whose email wants to handle those questions. So the answer is always yes. Yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's just how do you do it? The yes. answer is yes. The the challenge is that these wines are, as people typically know, they're uh, they're fairly uh, sought after. So many of the different vintages are already sold out. But we do try to keep some back every year, in order in order to have other releases. We will send out a uh, notice to everybody who is registered. Which so. The 75 participants that are registered here uh, will get a notice uh, tomorrow or this afternoon um, about how to get which wines and which wines are actually available in the, in the Malbec program. So uh, we will send it out to everybody to make that happen. So you don't have to write anything down or do anything. Uh, you can always call your ambassador at the winery and they'll ha be happy to help you with, with anything. And and, and just like my email is easy, any Chapelet, any Chapelet employee, you take their first name and then say at Chapelet.com, uh, you get us. But also if you want customer service, it's customer service at Chapelet.com. So you've got a lot of ways to, to get to us and we'll make sure to, to reach out. Um, I had another question that came through that asked uh, if there would ever be a children's coloring book for the dragons. And I have long thought that's a great idea. And I um, I now actually am starting to draw some of my dragons on the computer where I can do layers so I can do the black and white outline. So yes, coming soon, 
Uh, the more requests, the better, the sooner I could get it out because the more pressure would be on, on me to do that. But I would love to do that and, and I do have a plan to do it. So to let people know that actually on our website for the registration for the Dragon webinar, you can still buy the wine too. So it's still open too. So there, I hope that you have multiple ways of getting this wine um, and getting any other wines uh, from us. Uh, hopefully that's not going to be an issue for anybody. But of course, as Chris has said, you can call any of us at any time. We'll be happy to, to help you with that. So Carissa, I got a message here from somebody saying, where are these dragons going from here? And what's the next dragon? And what's, what's the next uh, exciting thing? Well, there's, uh, there's one dragon that's being bottled right now. And actually, if you, flip up the, if you flip back to the PowerPoint, I'll tell you about two more dragons that have already been created. A very few people have the 2017 uh, uh, Malbec, which is, has this dragon label. And this was a unique label that got created as a combination between uh, my niece Aubrey and myself, and hence the name of the dragon is Avcar. And so this dragon uh, is on the 2017, which was a very short vintage. We didn't even have enough to put it in all the club shipments. So uh, I'm not sure how the raffle happened for the people that could get this wine. Uh, but it was in short supply. The, the next vintage is being bottled right now, and this is Gibbous. And Gibbous always has uh, an umbrella and is uh, sometimes a little bit confused, and he wears a, a beautiful jacket, and you can see his wings just coming out from under the jacket. He also will be featured in uh, the upcoming book two, the long-awaited and much overdue book two. Uh, so this one is coming along and the dragon after this has not yet been created, but I'm uh, anxious to get back to my paints and my palettes. And, and the, the way the dragons get uh, hatched here in Big Sur is that I close out the rest of the world and I do my own um, shelter in place. And uh, I just put the pen or the paper and the paints, I usually paint with acrylics and they appear. So I don't have a preconceived notion as to who will be created next. They just, uh, they come. I think Gibbous, this is Gibbous the Elder, and he might have been inspired by the fact that I took a class this uh, last year with my mom. We took a class called uh, Modern Elders, and so I was surrounded by uh, ideas of the wisdom of the elders, and, and so that's where he got created. So Carissa, Somebody asked if it's still possible to get your first printing of your of your dragon book. Do you, is there still any more of those left? Do you or how do you, how do they go about getting one? Um, we might be able to do an auction. Okay. We could do a fundraiser. Okay. You want to start uh, right. There, so they're they're out of print. I I do have a few copies, um, and I'm looking for a a, a new publisher to try to uh, figure. I, was doing it, I'm doing it self-publishing, but the, the actual software that the last publishing house used no longer exists. So I have to start over to, do, to redo book one. So um, that's the long answer. It's, so do you uh, want to start, I'll start an auction right here? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> see how much people are willing to put up to buy yeah. the first book? Yeah, I can. Uh, so. Here's the book. Okay, so that book right there is up for auction right now? Yep, this book is up for auction and, and I'll autograph it and everything. I'll put a hundred bucks up for it. <laughs> All right. So what do they do? Can they just uh, chat it on their, on the, can they just put their bids on the chat? They, Let's see. Oh, we, oh there's 200. The we got 200. Or Wait, or where's, the money, where's the money going? Yeah, what's your what's favorite charity, Tuck? How about the Big Sur Fiddle Camp? Oh, Doug is Doug Rutherford is raising his hand. Let me see if I can. Oh, we've got 250 now. Okay, we great. are we are going to make this. This will go to a nonprofit. I don't know if, it, if uh, my suggestion of Big Sur Fiddle Camp will win out, but uh, it will be a, a nonprofit, so it will be uh, it will be tax deductible. Besides the fact that you'll get the book. 
Okay, we're at 250. We're going to, um, oh, 300, 300. Okay, do I hear 350? We've got 300. Do I hear 350? Come on, fakes. Let's, let's get on the, on the line here. Just enter with your chat. Just put in a number. We're going to be closing this out because our webinar is about to end. We're at 300. Do I hear 350? Come on, 350. Colorado, where are you? Let's go. Come on, Phil. Who's out there? We got Cindy. We got the shop house out there. Only three. Ah, 350. 350. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Anybody else want to take over as auctioneer? Because this is not my forte, but oh, 400. Yes. Oh, now we're talking. Okay. Uh, 400. And because we're going to have to close it soon, Alexa is telling us our time is up. So we are going once at 400. Going twice at 400. Thomas, you're going to get this at 400 sold. The book is yours. Uh, can Thomas, can you email me directly at carissa at chapelet.com? I'll make sure we get the personalized and we get all the details. Thank you so much. I've had fun playing this game. Cyril, back to you. So this is all fun and it's all marvelous. And to see so many people willing to stick around here for an hour to talk about dragons must be that there's a lot of enthusiasm for doing this. Uh, we enjoy these on Thursday afternoons at 4.30. Um, hopefully for those of you who are just about dinner time on, on the East Coast, uh, now it's 5.30, probably already into dinner um, on the California side that is, and so 8.30. Uh, on the East Coast. Uh, just want to welcome you back uh, next week to another fine and fun adventure uh, and be looking at our website and be watching for all of the oncoming uh, webinars. Philip, thank you so much. Um, I, I hope that uh, uh, you and Laura will have something to finish off those bottles with uh, <laughs> that will work for dinner. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we've, we've roasted, uh, we've, we've got a whole grilled salmon on this end that we're doing couple friends. Well, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Philip. That was a lot so. of fun. I've, I've never spent an hour talking uh, so extensively about Malbec, so um, I, I think it was what, really what was the What was the word for the, that the that grape gets? What's the? Stomate. 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 Yeah. Okay. I'm going to uh, use that tonight. Yeah. Well, Thank well, you. If anybody Thank really you. needs you. details. Have a safe evening. And we look everybody. forward to seeing you next, next week. Uh, let us know if we can help you in any way. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Night. Night.